Uh, we saw this earlier, the Peter Paul Rubens uh, painting. And just to refer back to it, also very saturated. Interesting that you have a figure here with a very bright red uh, garment under here. This fellow here also has a very bright blue garment. So uh, again, just, you know, they're not being subtle about it. It's red. They're committing to it. Let's see what we got next. Come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love this picture. I don't know if you're familiar with this photographer named Saul Leiter. Uh, he passed away just last fall, but an incredible photographer. Uh, lived in New York City all his life. And what's interesting is that uh, he was, he's also a painter too, by the way. He was taking color photos when it was not hip or cool or the thing to do. It was back in the 40s, 50s, you know. Uh, another kind of strain you have in photography, especially in art photography, is that it's not art photography if it's not black and white, you know. Color is like, nah, you know, color is for the masses. It's for the unwashed masses. But we're artists, so we go black and white. And I never understood that. Because so, I mean, right, I mean, think about it. How many painters, how many Rembrandts have you seen that have been black and white, right? Uh, how many Vermeers have been black and white? It's always been in color. And this whole idea of the photography to be serious has got to be black and white, it doesn't make any sense to me, you know, because uh, think about, uh, look, when photography first came out, okay, once the novelty was over, when people had kind of used to photography, you know, being this magic box that can recreate reality, the first thing they started asking is saying, well, can't you make it in color? You know, why is it all black and white? And that's why you will see many photos where they were actually tinted. They were hand tinted and painted over to make them look more real. So there's always been a desire for color. Again, nothing wrong with black and white. So I don't want all the black and white people beating me up afterwards, all right? Uh, and I take black and white, which I've showed you a couple of examples. But, but I'm just saying that if you want to do something that's more artistic and loftier, there's nothing wrong with color. And lighter is a great example of it because he took uh, these amazing pictures that are in reality. He's, it's a cab, right? There's a little hand here. But he crops it and composes it in such a way that it's abstract. And then he doesn't mess around with the colors. I mean, it's pure yellow and red, and it's just bold, and it just commands attention. And again, it's a whole different feel, especially for that time period when people were, you know, mostly black and white. Uh, here's a picture I took a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, of a model, aspiring actress in Brooklyn, Williamsburg. And as I was driving to her apartment, we were going to do the photos indoors, I saw this building right down the block from where she lives, and it was painted this green and red. And I said, you know, we've got to get a picture there one way or another. That's just amazing. So. Um, Again, I was not afraid of uh, jolting colors, you know, this green and this red, which is kind of orange. And then she also, I mean, she's got this very black hair. I mean, it's not brown, it's black. And then this white dress. And I just thought all those hard colors just gave it a certain punch. And again, very different from this kind of a picture. And I'm not picking on that picture, by the way. It's a very good picture. But I'm just saying that is something we've seen a million times. We've seen those in every magazine cover, pretty much. And so why not try to venture out and do something a little different? Uh, colors don't have to be saturated. They can also just be weird, okay? Uh, this is a uh, painter named El Greco, okay? The Greek. Uh, he's a Greek guy, uh, but lives in Spain. And here, very bold colors, once again, but kind of weird colors, to me anyway. I mean, because this is like really bold, but then look at his face and the rest of his body. It's kind of muted. So a very strange composition there. And then here is another one, just to give you an example. Uh, again, you know, it's almost like the photo's all about the garment. His face is pretty muted, uh, the gloves, the hands. The background, the background thing is a weird choice of color. It's like this yellow with some brown. And then this kind of, I mean this in the kindest way. Uh, it's not like he's alive anymore, he's gonna do anything about it. But to me, it, it makes me nauseated. It really does. It's just a sickly color scheme. Uh, but, you know, he's hanging in the museums. I'm not, at least not the big ones anyway. So what do I know? So that's uh, El Greco. So, you know, you could do that with your photos too. You know, you can mess around with, uh... in fact, Saul Leiter, the fellow with the cab that I mentioned earlier, he would intentionally take photos with, with film that was way past its expiration date. You know, film that we would have thrown out. And he found that by doing that, it also affected the colors. So you never know. There's, there aren't rules with it. Now, 
contrasts right, this picture with this Caravaggio we saw earlier. Here, colors are very muted, very, you know, very earthy. Uh, so that's another way of going. You can desaturate colors. You can do that again in Photoshop. You can do it in the camera too, to some extent. Um, Annie Leibovitz, many of you probably know who she is, famous Rolling Stone photographer. And uh, this is a photo she did not too long ago of Queen Elizabeth. And again, uh, lots of color. There's a richness. I mean, it is the, you know, the Queen's palace. But the colors are relatively subdued. You know, they're not in your face like the other pictures I've, I've shown you. Uh, here's another one uh, also. Uh, and, and now you see more of the elements, right? You've seen the use of light, the use of line, the use of color. Uh, all together to create this very unique image. I mean, she must know what she's talking about. I mean, uh, Annie Leibovitz, you know, she's really up there in photography. Um, these are the next two elements, mass and space. And I kind of grouped them together because they're really hard to talk about separately. I mean, all these things are interrelated, as I mentioned, but these two are really interrelated, I think. Mass and space. Mass is uh, just the solid object that you're photographing. That's what it refers to. So it might be, you know, the interior, it might be the building, it could be a deer, whatever that is. The, the space, of course, is, you know, the space around that subject. So how those interrelate can also really affect your photography. Here's a painting by Albert Bierstadt. It's at the Brooklyn Museum. So you can go check this out. This thing is stunning. Any of you ever seen this painting for real? Oh man, you've got, yeah. This thing is incredible. First of all, it's really big. It's, uh, a little bit wider than this screen, believe it or not. And it's almost like you're, you stepped into it. And uh, here you can see that there are some, you know, definitely there's some mass. I mean, you see it here with these uh, mountains, but even these clouds up here, you know, very solid, lots of weight to it. Uh, but there's also a sense of space, right? So you have this angle kind of takes you through and by doing that, it makes this, you know, more prominent. It kind of amplifies it. So it's, that's how they're kind of related. If it was just big mountains, you know, you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't have the contrast. Uh, what he also does, which is really hard to appreciate here because it's just too small and, you know, it's a projected low resolution washed out image. But I put a little arrow there. Not that it's going to help you anyway, because I can't even see it. I'm right in front of it. But right here, there are actually some figures. There's some hunters. Uh, even when you see it in person at the, at the museum, you can barely notice it. But there's some uh, hunters, I think they're Indians, Native Americans. Uh, some are on foot, some are on horseback, chasing some deer. There's a little dog over here, too. Over here is a dead deer, I guess, that they caught earlier. So he puts that in there for scale. So that amplifies it even more. You, know, you see those tiny figures, you go, wow, this thing is just incredible. And this is a style of painting referred to as the sublime. You know, something that uh, shows uh, something that's awesome, you know? Not in the surfer dude sense of the word awesome, but like awe-inspiring, kind of makes you small and projects the majesty of nature. Uh, I'm sure you recognize this. If you don't know who the, who the photographer is, you've certainly seen the picture perhaps in posters, but this is an Ansel Adams. So I thought it was kind of interesting. You know, uh, not the same thing exactly, but, you know, the same concept. You know, this, the mass here, the mountains, but also this kind of takes you through the picture. You don't really have, uh, I don't think there's any figures that I could see in it to give you a sense of scale. But you can kind of get the sense of some of the trees. Right along here, along the river bank, there's some trees that are felled. Um, so when you see the higher resolution photo, you, you know, it gives you a sense of the, um, you know, the scale. And interesting, you know, it's all black and white, but it's using black and white as a color. So instead of reds and greens, you know, it's gradations of gray and black and white. Uh, here's another saw lighter. You can tell I like saw lighter. But uh, very interesting picture, again, uh, early use of color before it was uh, popular to use it. And the mass, see the mass doesn't have to be in your face or obvious, it could be very subtle. Here it's just this little hint that someone is about to step into the road 
or maybe got on the road into the sidewalk. We're not really sure what the motion is, but you see the, the red umbrella. Looks like it's part of a raincoat or something here. We can't even tell if it's male or female. It's really hard to tell. Uh, but it's mostly snow, something we're all too familiar with nowadays. And again, it kind of takes you through. There's like a path that goes this way, but it kind of takes you that way as well. So you have that sense of space. But what's interesting here is that by putting the figure there and that little hint of color, it kind of pulls your eye there. So it, it creates a tension. Usually, we all know about the rule of thirds. If you're a photographer, you've probably heard of that, right? You don't put things directly in the middle. This is like the rule of sixteenths. I don't know what it would be. But you know, he's really pushing that over here. So that's not a bad photo. That's a good photo to do, and a very daring. What's interesting about that is that uh, in painting, you would never see, or rarely see, especially with the old masters, any kind of uh, part of the subject cut off, right? That was just a bad form. But you started seeing that happening with photography. And then as that started happening with photography, and people saw the interesting compositions that created, painters started adopting that too. Then you see more paintings with you know things up in the corner. Was there a question? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, the question was, was there a title? Because we're videotaping this, so I want to make sure they know what the question was. The title, I think, is just Red Umbrella. I don't know that he actually titled things specifically, but he has many photos with red umbrellas, either red or pink. Uh, he really liked certain things in his, um, you know, in his work. You see lots of photos that were taken in snowy weather or rainy weather, uh, photos that were taken through uh, glass, like in a, in a diner, where it's all fogged up and kind of drippy, and then that would create this abstract uh, appearance of what's outside. So I don't know that he had formal titles, but if you were to Google uh, Saul Leiter, it's L-E-I-T-E-R, they put right umbrella, you're going to get a whole bunch of Google images, and you'll pretty much get a sense of his work with that. Uh, so this is just one of several. He also does this a lot too, where things are off in the corner like that. What it does is it creates another kind of space that you might hear about sometimes in art circles called negative space, right? So this would be considered the negative space. And how you incorporate that into an image can really make a big difference. This is what we call composition, ultimately. How you put it all together, how you compose it. It's like writing a song, right? Uh, here's uh, Carte Bresson, right? Very famous French photographer. Uh, a master at, you know, space and mass. Uh, what he liked to do with mass was to use it in a way where it created shapes. Uh, geometry was really big in Cartier-Bresson's um, work. As is, I think, in most photographers, but he in particular was just really great at it. And I mean, I've seen many photos, as I'm sure you have, of uh, spiral staircases. It's hard not to, like, you know, shoot it up or shoot it down. I think it's really interesting that he had all these little heads here, all these little kid spaces. I haven't seen that before. And what's great about it is that it gives you an even greater sense of, you know, just how far back it goes, right? So it's like that painting I showed you with the beer stat, right, with the mountains and the little uh, figures of the hunters. It kind of amplified and made mountains even bigger. So he does that with these faces. Because if you look at this little face over here, you know, then you say, that's really going back a far away. And it's interesting how he used all the other elements. So light, right? He made sure that every face was pretty much lit. So they're not obscured. And that's important because by having that little face lit back there, you could see it. And then you kind of get a sense of how far back we're going. Uh, also, his use of the line. You get this little curl here. It's almost like a wave, right? Um, the line is also not crisp, crisp like that Ang painting I showed you. You know, this is what was considered a lo-fi photo at that time. It was 35 millimeter, which photography snobs looked at back then too. You know, it's not a large format camera. There's grain, oh my God, there's grain. But the grain is part of the image, and now people, you know, want grain in their photos again because the digital images are too clean now. So it's funny how people are with that. There was a question here. Yes, sir? Did he title that? Yeah, the question was, did he title this picture? And I don't think he did. You know, let me check for a second. Maybe I have it right here. Yes. So this should be escargot. <laughs> escargot. Perhaps. Were you setting me up for that joke? I think you were. I'm a joke guy here. But actually, it got me curious now whether there was a title. I don't think there was, though. But if you Google uh, 
I shouldn't advertise for Google. If you do a search online, let Google pay me. Uh, if you do a search online uh, for uh, car tape or selling, you'll see lots of really interesting images like that. Yeah, I don't have a question mark to it, so there wasn't a title to it. I, I often check to see their titles too. But anyway, so that's his work. Very interesting use of space. Also very sparse, you know, not a lot going on, but it's about the geometry. I try to do that too. Again, I wasn't cognizant of that particular picture, but this is a photo from uh, Weir Farm that I mentioned earlier, the empty rooms. And again, it's a challenge to photograph empty rooms, so what do you do? So uh, there was this one particular spot where I literally had to like press myself against the window as much as I could without destroying it. Probably shouldn't even say that because you're videotaping this. The people at Weir Farm are going to find out about it and then I'm in trouble. But I was just making that up about pressing against the window. I, really do that. I was just going back as far as I could without touching anything. And then I took this shot because I really wanted to get this doorway framed by this doorway and then framed by that window. And then of course it goes continues outward into the you know into the woods, whatever's back there. So again, in the actual print you could see the stained glass and the detail back there, but you know, just it's just playing with geometry, playing with mass and shapes and giving you a sense of space. So that's a way to try to make an empty room with just doorways somewhat interesting. I was also able to play with the color. Uh, the light was very strong behind me. It's a very clear day, so I got some of the blue reflecting here. Trees behind me gave me the green, so none of that was Photoshop. It was just there. It's just looking for it. Um, so, you know, having said all that, I just wanted to return to Ansel Adams' quote about a photograph is usually looked at, uh, but seldom looked into. Uh, I'm hoping that, I mean, I gave you a very brief tour. This is a whole college course, you know? But I'm, I'm hoping that if you think about line, light, color, mass, and space, uh, and thinking about how you can play with those things as part of your palette as a photographer, it might, you might take something you don't, usually don't do. And what's great with digital photography is that it's cheap in the sense that you're not worrying about having enough film left. I mean, obviously it depends on your, the capacity of your memory card and your battery, so maybe you have a different concern there. But you also don't have to worry about, i got to wait a couple weeks for the picture to come back to me from the lab, or I have to go now and develop in my dark room. I mean, you can look in the LCD and see right away what the, re the results are. Oh, that's another thing that's annoying me. I'm sick and tired of these photographers saying, oh, you shouldn't be chimping. Have you heard that phrase, chimping? Yeah, it's, it's, looking, it's actually a phrase. It's photographers who turn, the, they take a picture, look at the back of the camera, and go, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not making it up. It's actually a photographer. It's so stupid. Chimping. I don't know. What is it with photographers? It gets so hung up about stuff. Ooing, yeah. Ooing. That's why the screen is there, dummy, so you can look at it. You know, it's supposed to be there. So there's nothing wrong with looking at the, the, the screen. Uh, by doing that, you get a, a sense in real time of what's going on. And so you actually amplify, to use that term again, your learning rate. Right, because before you'd have to wait, and you got to remember what you did two weeks ago. Now you can see on the spot, and you can start adjusting as you go. So why not experiment and take chances? Um, but so you might again incorporate some of these elements in a way that might give you a different style that's distinct to you. Now I've been blabbing for a long time, and I know we covered a lot of stuff. Before we go further, any other questions? I would love to take questions. Yes, ma'am. The question was, what kind of equipment do I have? Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, photography has become like computers now, you know? And again, there's certain photography geeks that are into the gear. And I think, as you notice, I'm not about the gear. I'm, I'm about, in fact, that leads me to my last line. What's the most important piece of equipment that you have? It is your brain. B-R-A-I-N. I don't care what kind of camera you have. If your brain is not engaged, you're going to take lousy pictures, you know? So, nevertheless, it is important to have good tools because they can make your job easier. So you try to get the best that you can within your budget, within whatever the needs are that you have, right? But, but what I was saying was, um, you know, 
cameras are like computers now. So as soon as you buy them, you know, they're obsolete. Because in six months, they come up with something better. And that's just the way the manufacturers make money. Uh, some photographers are insecure, so they feel they always got to get the better thing. And especially guys, you know, they always want to one-up each other. So I will proudly say that I have a mere Nikon D200. You don't like it? Too bad. That's what I use. It's an old camera by today's standards, you know? But when I bought it back in 2007, or whatever it was, when it came out, it wasn't a top-of-the-line thing, but it was pretty good for its time, you know? And it fit my budget. I was just starting out as a photographer, so I wasn't sure if, you know, it was going to go anywhere. It was before my whole weird farm thing. Uh, but I bought it, and, you know, I bought, uh, you know, the best lens I could afford. And, and I still use it to this day. You know, it, it serves my purposes. It's, you know, the noise on it's a little bit higher than maybe a newer camera because they're always improving the sensors. But I'm not worried about that stuff. What's more important to me is to get the, uh, an image that hopefully will, you know, motivate somebody. See, my thing is this, okay? I am a big fan and friend of the national parks. I think they are America's treasure. I think it's really important that we protect them and conserve them and visit them. I think that it's a way to bring, uh, to elevate um, America's uh, collective thought. You know, I think there are some things about FDR or Theodore Roosevelt or William Floyd or Julian Alden Weir that are worthy of attention. You know, above and beyond what's happening with Kim Kardashian, right? I know Kim Kardashian's very important, but I think other things are important too. So what I try to do with my photos is to like, take them of these, I try to go to every park I can, I try to convince them to get them to commission me to take pictures. And then what I do is I like, zip them like crazy, and I'm hoping that what that does is it'll uh, inspire people to think about our history and think about these visionary leaders, uh, faults and all, you know? And maybe even go to the parks and visit them, uh, especially kids. So I'm trying to do something. And also there are people who can't go to a park. They live in another country. Uh, they're disabled, they can't afford it, whatever it might be. They can also vicariously experience a park by going online and looking at the photos. So that's really the important thing. But I do use a Nikon D200. I have other stuff. I mean, I have tripods, I have uh, uh, soft boxes and lights, uh, flashes. Uh, I have a variety of things that I acquire little by little, you know. So I'm not against gear, but I'm also not dependent on it. Uh, I think it's important to spend at least as much time uh, working the brain and thinking about what makes an image compelling as it does to research the latest, uh, you know, the latest camera. I also have a second camera. It's also a Nikon. It's a Nikon uh, D something. I don't even know what it is. It's a cheaper camera, but I use it as a second camera. Sometimes I don't want to carry that big heavy thing around with me, and so I have a smaller one. Uh, I have another Nikon, it's uh, even smaller. Yeah, it's a point and shoot, but you can make all the adjustments as with a DSLR. So I'll use that for street photography, you know, so I can sneak up on people. Because if you bring the big camera, then they know to run away. So I use the, uh, especially family members, so I use a smaller one. So again, it's about buying things that, uh, that will suit, you know, whatever has to be met. To me, cameras and lenses and lights and all that stuff are just like tools, you know, so you, uh, you get the tools that you need for whatever the, the job is. That's a good question. Any other questions out there? There must be. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, oh, thanks very much. Thank One person liked it. That's great. <laughs> I did my job. What about the, the role of, I guess, emotion and passion in the pre-visualization? Because a lot of these are you know, individual specific aspects of a photograph, but it seems, at least for me, mm -hmm. that often, especially when I'm traveling out west and I see that space that calls me, right, and then I have to figure out all this stuff, is that emotion or that passion that first comes out and then how do I put that into a picture that's going to somehow get passed on to my observers, right? Okay, in case I didn't come across in the video, uh, the question, and I'm paraphrasing, was basically how does a passion and emotion, I guess, fit in or interrelate with these elements that I talked about? And that's a very important part because the idea is not to be mechanical and think about these, you know, these different elements. I mean, I don't even think about them when I shoot. You know, it's just, I, I want to go with intuition. The best way that I can explain it, uh, and I don't know if it's going to help anybody, but I'm going to compare it to music, because I have a lot more uh, of a background as a musician than anything else. But uh, like as a musician, whether you're into jazz or rock or whatever, 
you know, I have to learn the scales and the chords, uh, the time signature, right? So that I can play with the band. Uh, but if you want to be a really good musician, you don't follow those things slavishly, you know? Just like, you, I mean, there are musicians who do that and they sound terrible, they sound very clinical. So the idea is to know it well enough so that it's internalized and then you can forget about it. And then what happens is, if I know what key we're in and I know what time signature we're in and I know what the chord progression is, I can start to improvise now. And I can do my Jimmy Page thing, you know, whatever it is, or Paul McCartney, and, and create on the spot, basically. That's what improvisation is. And then I'm kind of going with my feeling. So if it's a song that's a real downer, you know, I might play longer, slower notes with lots of space in between notes. Again, that's negative space to tie it in. If it's a song that's upbeat and raucous and, you know, very rebellious, then it's going to be a whole different thing. Maybe more like Hendrix, right? So I think in photography, it's kind of the same way. You kind of want to be aware of the different elements that kind of create an image but not to the point where it's going to hamper you. And maybe in the beginning, if you're not used to thinking this way, you might have to be more cognizant of it, because that's how you learn it. But after a while, you just throw it out. And then you're going more with the emotion. So like, again, uh, the example I gave earlier with the uh, lady who's a spoken word artist, uh, first thing I did was I said, email me all the lyrics to your songs. I'm going to read every song, and I'm going to create a, uh, a list of all the key words that seem to pop up a lot, all the synonyms. And I noticed that the song was very, uh, you know, very deep, very melancholic, you know, very introspective. And so I said, well, we need something that kind of reflects that in the photo. And so then I started thinking, well, I want lots of shadow. I want it to be kind of dark. I want colors like blue, right? Having the blues, right? So you start almost being like a painter and you're kind of putting it together. And then once you're there, you kind of go with it because you can't over plan it. And that's a perfect example, because I had a whole different idea in mind, and there were a bunch of technical things that kind of changed things up, and then I kind of had to go with it. But I think that's the way to do it, ultimately. The photo also of the, uh, of the slave burial ground at the William Floyd estate. Same thing, I was very moved by that burial ground. Again, it's not confirmed whether slaves are actually under there, uh, but it's believed to be the case. And I just thought it was very uh, moving that they're there with just this very simple cross with just one name on it, not even a last name, no date of birth, no when they died. And then in stark contrast, right across the way, you have the Floyd Family Cemetery, these elaborate tombstones that have all the details there, first name, last name, brother of this, sister of that guy, and died this year and all that. So I said, well, you know, I want it to be more emotional, so I'm gonna put a lot of blur in there because it's almost kind of dreamlike and melancholic and almost kind of ghostly and go black and white. And so that's kind of what I want to get across. And so far from the feedback I've gotten from the exhibit, you know, people seem to be catching that. Was there a question over here? I did have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question is that he says that ever since 9-11, it's becoming much more difficult to photograph uh, you know, nationally prominent locations if you come in with a tripod. And what can he do? What can he say? And what you need to tell them is, X sent you. No. That's a surefire way to get arrested. Uh, I'll tell you what I think about that, because yeah, it is difficult to walk around with a, with a tripod. You know, when they see a tripod, they think professional photographer, he's going to capitalize and commercialize this, and then, you know, he's going to jab somebody with it or scuff up the floor. So I kind of understand that, you know, uh, everybody's, you know, on edge about it. Uh, and I'm glad you asked that question, that that goes back to these elements. What that means is we got to think outside the box. I mean, the main reason we're having a tripod is to have you know, a steadier photo, you know, that's, that's clear, right? So there's no motion. But we may not have that option. So do we not take the photo or do we work with what we've got? Some folks will say, well, I'm not going to take the photo because my vision is, you know, I work with a tripod. Me, I go, nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to find a way to get that picture. So, you know, I might have to rely on anti-vibration 
or I might have to use my wife's head as a tripod. I've actually done that. You know, she's short enough, I'm tall enough, I put the camera on her head, and she's really nice about it too. And I just steady it on that, and I've done it. You know, or I lean on something, or I say, you know what, screw it. You know, you know, sharpness be damned. Let's just blur the picture up, and I'm going to try to incorporate that artistically and get something out of it. And that's sort of about all you can do. I, I actually kind of welcome the restriction because what it does is it forces me to think outside the box and then try to do something different. There was a very, uh, I read this in Architectural Digest a while ago. Somebody famous said to a famous architect, you know, uh, if you build me the most beautiful building possible. And the architect had no way of starting. It's like, well, the most beautiful building possible. Do I use brick? Do I use glass? Uh, what colors? What size? What shape? But when the, but if you say to him, well, build me the most beautiful building possible, only using brick. Now ideas start to solidify because now you're narrowing your options. So that's the only thing I can say to that. But I, I do know what you mean. There are some days where you know you really do want to use a tripod. You maybe try to get by with a monopod, you know, maybe. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sometimes they don't even let you take the camera, or they don't want you to use flash. So it, it's really difficult. You know, sometimes you got to be a little surreptitious. I'm not uh, officially advising anybody does that, but I'm just saying theoretically, you know, you could happen. Your finger could happen to fall on the shutter when the guard is looking the other way. I mean, those things happen sometimes, right? And sometimes you get a good photo, so what are you gonna do, right? What are you gonna do? But again, that's, that's part of the challenge, I think. As a musician, many times I've played in places that had lousy sound, right? The sound engineer didn't know what they're doing as far as mixing things. You know, again, I had a drummer who's just an idiot, and I had to somehow make great music. I can't let that stop me. And, uh, and I don't mean this in a bragging way. I'm just saying you know, there have been many times where notwithstanding the limitations, I was able to get across. And I know that because people come up to me afterwards and say, that was pretty awesome on the guitar, you know? So that's really encouraging to know that, you know, if you really want to, if you're really passionate about the art, nothing is gonna stop you. You will find a way to make it work. And that's kind of what this whole discussion is about. So I really like these questions folks are asking because I think you're connecting the dots. And there must be other really good questions out there. No? You're all tired of me? Get out of here. We want to, we got to go to the bathroom. We want to hear the next speaker. That's uh, okay. So we'll do that. We can, we can stop here. If a question does pop up, uh, I do want to give away something, though. Oh, we now come to the no shame segment of my program, because I have no shame. So I'm going to bluntly and boldly say to you all that if you have contacts, if you have an uncle who's a curator at the Met, if you have a, somebody, if you're married to the editor of the New York Times, uh, if you know somebody who needs a photographer to take a picture of an old building or something, uh, I do ask that you share that with me because um, th this is my thing. You know, I, I really want to do this to the best of my ability. It's not just taking photos. Uh, There's really kind of a mission component to it. I'm not comparing myself to Ansel Adams by no stretch of the imagination, but I am inspired by his example in the sense that he did use photos to inspire people out east who didn't see these grand parks out in the west to care for them and protect them. And uh, we have beautiful parks out west, but we have some really interesting parks in the northeast. They're more subtle, they're more brain-oriented, because they're, they're steeped in history. But parks like, 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 like this one, you know, Roosevelt, Vanderbilt, and, and Valkyrie, they should be visited just as heavily as all the other parks. And I'm not suggesting that they're not, because they actually have quite a huge visitation uh, numbers here at these parks. But, uh, you know, as, as the country gets older, we have a new, newer generation of people who may not be as familiar with FDR. Uh, isn't that that guy on the dime? Uh, so, you know, I think it's important that images can remind people, you know, these places. So that's kind of my thing. So I try to, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm going to tell you right now. I will, you know, I seek out publicity, you know. Uh, last year I had a really nice article written in, in the New York Times on the Sagamore Hill pictures, the Theodore Roosevelt ones. And that was just awesome because that gets read by a lot of people and it draws attention to that park. You know, it's, it's the kind of park because it's on Long Island. It's like a destination park. You go there because you need to go there because you want to go there. It's not on the way to anything. 
So it was really important to get that kind of exposure. So if you have any suggestions, you know, places you might be able to help me out with, I appreciate it. Buying prints, I try to price my prints so they're affordable to everybody. I try not to be an art snob and put like a $5,000 figure because I want to say I have $5,000 photos. You know, you can buy pictures like for 10 bucks or they got pictures for $10. Of course, they're the size of a postage stamp. No, no, they're bigger than, they're, they're bigger than that. But, you know, you can get a really, you can get an eight and a half by 11 for 30 bucks, you know? Uh, you know, high quality print. And I got higher ones that have been exhibited. They're a frame you can spend more on depending on what your tastes are. But all that money goes to help me fund to this stuff, you know, because I do buy equipment every now and then. So that money helps me with that and the travel and promote and all that. Uh, but let me give away a print. So uh, you'll see that at the bottom, you don't have to do this if you, if you don't want, but if you put in your name, address, and uh, what is it, name and email, right? Name and email. If you want to include your address, uh, your social security number and your driver's license. That will help me out a lot in financing my career. And you might as well give it to me because the, uh, the NSA has it. So you might as well just do it. But if you just, it's already been perforated, so if you kind of fold it back and forth, it should tear fairly easily. And uh, can I get a volunteer to collect those? Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Maybe another volunteer so she's not doing it all herself. My wife will do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you just collect those and bring them up to me. The, the picture I'm giving away, we already did questions, is a, oh, you know what? I forgot about this too. Uh, if you go to my website, unfortunately, it's not www.x.com. If you go there, it might be not the kind of site you expect, <laughs> different kinds of photos. Uh, you want to go to xiomaro.com, X-I-O-M-A-R-O, and uh, on the, as soon as you get to the home page, there's a place where you can download uh, a free ebook. It's basically, uh, I think it's about 20 some odd pages. It's a PDF, and it has all the photos from the collections on exhibit at the African Burial Ground National Monument. And if you poke around, there's another place where you can also download an ebook of the Sagamore Hill Theodore Roosevelt photos that are on exhibit at Harvard. So it's the photos, it also has some written content and uh, that'll just download for you. But the prize print I'm giving out is a five by seven of that one. That's the North Room, where Teddy would meet with dignitaries and powerful people and uh, plan the Panama Canal and help the Russians and the Japanese sort out their differences and reach a peace treaty for which he got the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, first president to get it. So how we're doing that? Then I probably went way over time, didn't I, though? A little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, everybody. It's your fault. You ask me all those questions. It's a lot of content, you know. So. Oh, we have. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. How are we gonna do it? My wife is asking how we're gonna do this. Here's how we're gonna do it. Take that, fan them out like a, like, a, like a deck of cards. I'm going to close my eyes, and I'm just going to pick one. It could happen. I could win. No, I, I didn't fill one out. Okay. You know, I'm not going to cheat. So, are you done shuffling? Oh, you're working on the shuffling? Okay. Any other questions while we're waiting on the shuffling? I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was worth your while. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here we go. If I had a, I, I thought you were kidding me. If I could only find a drummer, I'd have a drum roll here. It'd be so appropriate. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Where were you when I needed you years ago? All right, here's one that I picked. And the winner is... Hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Phyllis M. Stern? Or Sturm? Stern. Where's Phyllis? Hey, Phyllis, congratulations. Come on up here. There you go, a five by seven inch print. I signed it this morning, so it's fresh. Yep, it's all packed, so we don't ding it up or anything. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna be here for the rest of the day. So if you have questions, 
Uh, you want to share uh, your own photos if you have a, uh, a website that you share with me. I'd love to see them. Uh, or if you have an iPad, some fellows were showing me some photos in their iPads. I love to see it. I love photography, so I love to talk with you all. Uh, but the program just gets better. There's more to come. And so I'm going to turn it over to Bill Urban, the National Park Service. Bill, thank you. Tell us what happens next. Okay. Well, thank you. Next, that was uh, very stimulating. I'm going to have to grow another brain to think about all the things that he said. Um, we're going to take a break. It's uh, a little bit before 12, and uh, we'll be back hopefully by around 10 after 12. And then we'll look at you know, Jeff's presentation, which promises to be just as exciting. So walk around a little bit, stretch, come back in about 10 minutes. Unfortunately, our uh, snack bar is not open yet, but there are some candy bars and stuff in the bookstore if you're interested. And uh, like X said, he'll be here the rest of the day, so if you have any questions, come up and ask. Thank you all.